to Next Term University CEO Talks. For those of you who haven't been here, new employees, what we do is we run a series, typically monthly, of, of different uh, amazing CEOs. Um, and, and these are presentations where it's an hour long. And the idea is to provide access to both education and inspiration um, through just the stories and journeys different CEOs have gone through. And, and one of the greatest privileges I've had over the years is just meeting some of the most amazing individuals personally. And I think um, John definitely falls in that category. And I've had the fortune of a very big list of people I've met. And what I've done with CEO Talks has been incredibly selective, where I would say out of, I mean, my, my contacts that I have is close to 8,000 people of different executives and CEOs. And I've gone through really to handpick the people I think are the most inspirational that personally inspired me. And the purpose of CEO Talks is to provide access to those people here. Um, and what I've always seen is a lot of people read books, um, a lot of people see videos, read articles, but nothing beats meeting the person in such close quarters. We've got our San Francisco, Boston, um, London, as well as the other part of New York office all in video as well. And then give you a chance to ask questions um, because I think I was explaining to John, the, the path for most executives and CEOs who succeed, it's never linear. It's never sort of like you know, a path that's linear and straight, but a lot of ups and downs, a lot of failures, a lot of challenges. I've asked John to share you know, his story and his challenges there. But there's an interesting um, story I read recently. Um, it was a study that was done around, does money make people happy? There was a whole study that was done, and, and this group of scientists went through and created envelopes, and they put money inside the envelope. So $5, $20, $100, even $1,000 in an envelope, and they gave it to people all around the world. So in Canada, in Brazil, in the US, in Rwanda, and they gave all different increments, and the envelopes had one of two instructions. Spend the money on yourself, whether it's paying bills or buying things for yourself, or give it to somebody else. And then they called everyone or talked to everyone Probably in Rwanda, it was less of a phone call, but they talked to everyone at the end of the, of the day to see if they're happier. And they found across the board, those who spent money on themselves, same or unhappy, they actually weren't happier, but every single person who gave money away became happier. And more importantly, did it matter if it was five bucks or a thousand bucks? Every person who helped somebody else became happier. And it's something that we're huge believers in, in the DNA of our business. We talk about better me plus you equals us. As we get stronger, as we build abundance ourselves, um, only the abundance, those who are growing, can really give more. Um, giving is really important to us. It makes us happier. And as an organization, we can do it better. And John's group is one that we are starting to look at for projects like Code for a Cause, um, to add into the whole SA500 Kids aspect of funding um, education, not only in the US, but to go globally and fund education. So John is an individual. He wrote a great book, which I encourage you to get a copy of. So we're going to um, pay for anybody who's interested a copy of John's book, which is a very fast read, um, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World. Um, he's happy to sign copies as well. So this is complimentary copies we're going to pay for from the company. He also wrote a um, children's book. It's called Zach the Yak. Um, there's Zach the Yak and Zach the Yak with his new friend Quack. We practiced. We practiced last night. And so, so John's, John's, and these are great books. And he started the business in Nepal. Um, it happens that, that my 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 um, child taker or child child caregiver is from Nepal. She loves the whole story, of course. Um, has seen the book before. Um, my son is three, a little over three. He's been reading the book, and every time it comes home, he's like telling me, "Dad, Zach the Yak," like, and he starts speaking about this. But it's just a great. Um, tool and a product both in his book but also the kids books so anybody who wants copies please come up afterwards John's happy to sign copies if we run out we'll get more afterwards um, but John is one that I met at this retreat I went to recently and we happened to sit next to each other and he was moderating and it's funny because I had seen John first in an episode of Oprah so I don't watch a lot of episodes of Oprah, so probably of the half dozen I've ever seen, this happened to be one of the episodes. And it was this great inspirational story of this guy who quit Microsoft, I guess 11 years ago now, um, and just literally went on a backpack and went through the country of Nepal, found you know 
poor villages and started to build libraries and schools um, to help people get schooling. And a lot of the schooling is actually highly focused on girls um, because there's a lot of studies, I guess, that were done or they found that um, women who get educated tend to educate kids more. So it passes on. And so this effort of educating girls in high impoverished countries globally, and John's gone around this process. They now are at 600 employees of which, I think, is it 75 or so in their San Francisco office? Is that, is that about, yeah, about, about, yeah. And, and, and the rest all locally. And they build these sustainable communities. They built 13,000 libraries so far um, in developing countries. So highly inspirational. I sat next to him and I was like, did I see you in Oprah? We connected. We went, we just nearly just hit it off, started going back and forth in, in hours of dialogue. Then he came to visit us, told more of what we're doing. And so we're really excited to have John here. So I will turn over to John Wood, the CEO of Room to Read. Conference block. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And hi to uh, London, San Francisco, Boston, and the other New York office. Hello to everybody who's watching us. Oh, good. Some of them are waving back. <laughs> At least one of the offices is waving back. London's not waving back, though. <laughs> um, well, great. Well, it's really great to be here, and it's great to have a chance to tell all of you about my passion, uh, which is bringing education to the poorest of the poor. Uh, probably like many of you, um, I think probably all of us have an ancestor who was born into poverty. It might be a parent, it might be a grandparent, it might be a great-grandparent, but as we know, at one point of human history, everybody on earth was poor. And almost everybody who broke the cycle of poverty almost always has a story that involves education to thank for it. I see a lot of you nodding. You can probably think about a parent or a grandparent who might have been the one to get a lucky break to get an education. And then with that lucky break comes education for all future generations. And uh, my passion around Room to Read is because my father grew up in poverty. He grew up in Denver. He was one of seven children. His parents didn't have much of an education. I think his father had about a third grade education. And he grew up in a house that was not a print rich environment. The house didn't have a lot of books in it. And my father never was a very good student. But when he um, was 20 years old, he was given a scholarship to go to university. Went to the University of Denver, got a civil engineering degree, ended up working for Boeing, for Skikorsky on helicopters, for Ward LaFrance, a fire engine company. When you're a young boy and your dad works for a fire engine company, that's a pretty good thing. And my dad and my mother always said to us that we got lucky, that we were born in the right place at the right time, that had we been born you know, one continent away or had we been born in a different family, we might not have been a middle class family. And so I, grew, I don't know about the rest of you, I grew up in a middle class family, small town in Pennsylvania, um, <clears throat> and lived for the fact that I got to go to a school library every week. I don't know if any of you were library geeks. Uh, I know it's not cool to say you're a library geek, but we're in polite company. I see a lot of nodding. I loved our school library and I loved our village library, even though our community only had 5,000 people and was kind of a post-industrial uh, town that was down in its luck. We were up on our luck because in 1896, a woman had built a library in honor of her son who had died. And when I was young, I used to always bring home the scholastic book order forms and say, Mom, Dad, I want to order these. 20 books, these 25 books, and they would kind of say, what, hold on, we can't afford that many books. And in a stroke of brilliance that I think had a pretty high return on investment, they bought me a bicycle for my eighth birthday. And my parents said, use the bike to ride to the library, and then every book you want to read for the rest of your childhood can be read for free. And so let's fast forward from there. Uh, I'll come back to my personal history, and I, Charlie's going to kind of interview me a little bit. but. My life changed when I went to see a school in Nepal in 1998. I was uh, trekking in Nepal as a break from Microsoft at the time. I was director of marketing for Microsoft Australia, which in terms of overseas gigs was not really a bad gig to have living in Sydney, um, Australia. But I wanted to get off to Nepal because there was a rumor that if you went high enough in the Himalayas, you could escape the sound of Steve Ballmer screaming at you. And so I went, that was a joke. Um, not a very funny one, apparently. But, uh, <laughs> As Charlie knows, all my jokes usually die. But I went off to Nepal on an 18-day trek to get away from Microsoft, and it really clear my head. I had made a lot of money at a young age. I didn't know what it meant. I know it didn't make me a better person. It probably made me a greedier, greedier person. Um, and I just wanted to go off and just think about life for a few weeks. So I trekked the Annapurna circuit. I was lucky enough that on day two, a headmaster in a little village called Bahundan in Nepal asked me to come see his school. He invited me. He said, please, let me, let me show you the school. And I got excited thinking this is a chance to see the real Nepal, not the trekkers Nepal, not the tourists Nepal. 
Well, what I saw was pretty appalling. It, it, they, the school had about 75 to 80 kids crammed into a room um, that probably should have held about 30 or 40. Dirt floors, no desks, sheet metal roof that heated the room to about 100 degrees and that leaked, turning the dirt floor to mud. And it was pretty depressing. And then the headmaster said, well, let's, let's show you the library. Come see the school's library. And I got excited. I thought that would be the fun part of the tour, the optimistic part of the tour. The library's going to be full of kids with smiles on their faces reading books. Well, bad assumption. The library was an empty room where theoretically a library could have existed, but they had no books. And I said to the headmaster, why? You have 450 students coming every day. That's hopeful. Their parents are letting them come to school. They're, they're letting them off the farm for the day to come learn, but you have nothing to teach with. And the headmaster said, well, in Nepal, we are too poor to afford education. But until we have education, we are always going to remain poor. And that struck me as the cruelest thing I'd ever heard in my life, that any child could be told at age five or six or seven, we're too poor to afford education, but guess what? If you don't get it, that trap of poverty that your great-grandparents and your grandparents and your parents grew up in is going to be perpetuated. And that was a day that changed my life forever. Chapter one of my book is titled, Perhaps, Sir, You Will Someday Come Back with Books. That was the headmaster's very simple statement, his very simple request. And I got excited. I thought, this is a chance to pay it forward. I was reading, if, if you've not read the book, um, okay, I'm blanking on the title now. Um, I, was reading, I was reading the teachings of the Dalai Lama, and I can't remember the exact name of the book because he's written so many. But there was a section in the book where he talked about the fact that if you keep and hoard things and you're greedy, it will not make you happy. And if you give things away, it will make you happy. And we did not rehearse. We, we both believe this in, in our DNA, so we can say the same thing and say it in different ways. I had read the, teach the, the teachings, and I thought, well, this is a chance to pay it back. I can give this community a library. It shouldn't cost me a lot of money. I'll buy books. I'll do a book drive. I'll pay for the shipping. I'll fly back here. I'll personally deliver the books in the back of Yaks. And voila, a library. I'll be like the Andrew Carnegie of Bahundanda, Nepal. And I was really into that analogy because Carnegie is one of my heroes. He, he was viewed as being a greedy capitalist robber baron, but late in life he redeemed himself by opening over 2,500 libraries across North America. And these libraries have paid dividends for tens of millions of people generation after generation after generation. The busiest public library in America is here in New York. It's in Queens, which also happens to have the highest number, or proportion, I should say, of first-generation immigrants to America. When immigrants come to America, they get their kids the library card. My parents gave me the bicycle. The recent immigrants are giving their kids a library card. Learn, learn, learn. Read, read, read. Today's readers are tomorrow's leaders. We all know that. So I thought about that, and I thought, well, I can help this village out. So long story short, I sent out an email to my friends all around the world. And sometimes when you hit send on an email, you don't realize that you're unleashing these forces that are going to rip your life apart. But that's literally what happened to me. I gave my parents' address in Colorado. I forgot to clear that with them, but I volunteered them to be my book, my book reception point. We received 3,000 books within a month. Scholastic here in New York got behind it in a really big way, and they were cleaning out their closets, and we had 3,000 books. And my father and I went back a year later. So by now it's April of 99. I'm director of business development for Microsoft's Greater China region, living in Beijing, number two in China, working in both main, working in mainland Hong Kong, Taiwan take a week off, go with my 73-year-old father as my unpaid right-hand man. I tried to talk him out of it. He tried to talk me into it. My mother tried to talk me into it to get him out of the house, so it was two to one. <laughs> my parents overruled me and vetoed me, so my dad and I went back to Nepal and went to that, back to that village of Bahundan in Nepal. And showing up with 3,000 donated books, it was like the biggest day in the history of the village. The kids were lined up, the parents were lined up, the teachers were there. I had teachers who were holding my hand and crying, saying, you've given us so much and we have so little to give you in return. The littlest children had gone out in the forest and picked flower petals. And so as we went down the receiving line, the older kids were hanging marigold garlands around our necks and offering us a namaste. And the littlest children were putting little flower petals in our hand. And by the end of the line, we could have opened a flower shop. We had such an outpouring of affection from the village. But what was most amazing is when we actually took the books and actually, we didn't use yaks because we were at a lower elevation, so we had six donkeys. Um, but donkeys don't look as good on a book cover, so I used the yak. But <clears throat> we took the books off the donkeys, and it was like a mosh pit. The kid, it was like literacy palooza. The kids were stage diving onto the books. They could not 
believe, I could not believe, I should say, how excited these kids were. They had never seen brightly colored children's books before. And inherent in that moment was the beginning seeds of my exit from Microsoft. It was kind of my game over moment. I sat with my dad that night having a beer, talking about how cool this was, and I said, Dad, this is a drop in the ocean compared to what's needed. I've traveled in Vietnam. I've traveled in post-apartheid South Africa. I've traveled in post-Khmer Rouge Cambodia. This is needed in so many parts of the world where kids are basically cursed by the fate. At a young age, they were born in the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't have books. They don't have teachers. They don't have education. So long story shorter, I quit Microsoft in late 99, the height of the tech boom. Quitting Microsoft in 99 was probably a bit like quitting Facebook today. People didn't really believe me, they thought I was crazy, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I quit to start Room to Read because I didn't want to do this library thing in a small manner. I wanted to do it in a huge way that would ultimately impact tens of thousands of kids, hundreds of thousands of kids. Maybe one day if I could use my entrepreneurial skills and my business building skills, maybe I could even impact millions of kids. So that's how Room to Read was born. Um, to be clear, when I started it, I did not have a gazillion dollars. I could not afford to bankroll this thing myself. I could afford to take a risk and work for free for a couple of years and work without a paycheck and live off my savings, but I had to start raising money from day one because I think the easiest way in the world to be a philanthropist is to get a billion dollars, announce to the world you have a foundation, hang your sign outside the door, and there will be a queue from day one of people saying, wow, you've got a foundation, cool, I need money, I need money, I need money. When you hang a sign outside your door saying, I'm a startup charity with no budget and no background in education and no employees and not really much of a business plan, uh, nobody's lining up outside your door. So that was how I started. Literally, it was myself, my friend Dinesh in Nepal, who I'd met, who was my volunteer in Nepal, my father and mother. I left Microsoft and said, I got to start this. In January of 2000, just over 11 years ago, we opened our doors. And that's how we got started. So I'm going to stop mm -hmm. rambling and let Charlie yeah. drive here. So, so, so I, I know what's been helpful for us is I probably. The, the, the first part of the story was awesome, but now what happens after that? Because I think you know, the whole process of s the struggling starting, and I think Shimmy is here with us as well from Angel Wish, where, where you know, he, 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 he is one, you know, similarly, like, it's not, today, 600 employees, 13,000 schools, it just sounds like, wow, it must have been just a straight <laughs> upward climb. We would mm. love to hear some of the, 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 the ups and downs, the, the, yeah. the wins, but as much importantly, some of the things that, that weren't so easy, I guess, some of the challenges. Why don't, I t why don't I tell everybody where we are today, and then what we can do is we can work backwards from there. So let's fast forward to today, where are we? As Charlie yep. mentioned, about 600 employees. We are working now in 10 countries. Our goal is really to serve the poorest of the poor. So we're trying to work in countries that are probably in the world's bottom 50 of GDP per capita. But we're trying to work in countries where there's also enough social stability and political stability, you can actually get things done. Um, so we're not working in, let's say, Afghanistan or the South Sudan. My heart goes out to kids there. But if you don't have conditions of stability, it's hard to get parents thinking long-term of their kids' education. So we're working in sub-Saharan Africa. We're in South Africa. We're in Zambia. We're launching this year in Tanzania as our third African country. Uh, we were born in South Asia. Uh, today we're in Nepal. We're in India, our biggest country with the biggest need. 37% of the world's illiterate people live in one country. They live in India. And that number is going up not down. So those of us who love India, got to really get on that and help those kids. We're in Sri Lanka, we're in Bangladesh, and then in Southeast Asia, we're in Laos, one of the poorest countries in Asia. Cambodia, uh, which post Khmer Rouge is not going to have much of a chance of rebuilding a social, uh, stable society without education. And then in Vietnam. Um, our budget this year is $45 million. I'm really psyched about that, right? We started the first year, our budget was $35,000, and we managed to grow very, very quickly as a result of having these fundraising chapters all around the world. Today we have 57 cities, including here in New York and including Westchester and including Greenwich and including central New Jersey, where we have people who volunteer their time for Room to Read as fundraisers. They basically will do everything from do marathons to Room to Read, to beer blasts, they'll do raise the roof parties where in one night they'll raise enough money to fund a school, they'll get their companies involved, and we have over 10,000 people now in cities ranging from Austin to Boston, and I will point out that Boston, San Francisco, and London all have room to read fundraising chapters, so I hope that we can get um, everybody else from Next Jump involved. And they are really uh, helping us to say yes to more villages. We do three things, sorry, we do four things, and we try to do them at high quality and, with, and at scale. We build schools, we open libraries, we print local language children's literature, 
So kids will have books in their mother tongue, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And we uh, provide long-term scholarships for girls who are often left out of the system. Uh, to be clear, we're not anti-boy. As a former boy myself, I'd never want to be accused of being anti-boy. When we open schools and libraries and print books, they're gender neutral. They're available, of course, to both boys and girls. But throughout the developing world, quite often it's the girls and women who are left behind. So our girls' education program is designed to get more girls into the system, mentor them, coach them, give them homework help, and make sure they're staying in school and finishing um, secondary school. So Room to Read today by the numbers, we've opened 1,600 schools. We've opened 13,000 libraries. We've put over 11 million books into the hands of kids over 70% of which are mother tongue books that we're self-publishing. So we've become not only, the doc, not only the Andrew Carnegie of the developing world, we've become the Dr. Seuss of the developing world because we've become a really, really big publisher of children's literature. Uh, 11 million books, 6 million kids now have access to our schools and libraries. And our girls' education program, we have 13,500 girls who are supported each and every day, guaranteed to the end of secondary school through our girls' education program. So that's where we are um, today. So, back to your question of kind of the beginning years. I mean, I would say the toughest challenge for us was that 2000 was a terrible time to launch a charity. But if people remember their history, many of you were probably too young there to care much about the tech bubble, but the tech bubble burst in 2000. Stock markets went down by 50%. My own personal savings, which were heavily invested in tech, went down by more than 50%. And then September 11th happened. And America became this place that was quite a bit more, quite a bit more xenophobic and quite a bit less ready, willing, or able to engage with the rest of the world. And here I was going around the world with, you know, my hat in my hand, saying, "Will you give? Will you give? Will you give? Will you give?" That was a terrible time to launch a charity. So I think that one of the lessons I learned was you have to basically be unabashedly enthusiastic about making the ask. You know, Derek Jeter in a good year might hit 333 for fundraising. In a good year, you might hit 300. But you have to have the at-bats, because if you don't have the at-bats, you're not going to get the money. So I've learned from the very, very early days that I had to be out fundraising all the time. I had to not be ashamed to ask for the order, because I was not asking for money for myself. I was asking for money that I could then be a pass-through vehicle so that a school got built or a girl got to go to school or a book got to get printed. Um, I learned really to accept, accept rejection and not let it get me down. If anybody here is in sales, you know, that's a really tough thing. You can get really dejected if you are being rejected. But the minute you stop making the sales calls, you're in trouble. And the minute you psych yourself out, you're in trouble. So I basically went at it, and literally I went in to see Don Valentine, the, the founder of Sequoia Capital, Mark Andreessen, Bill Draper, the godfather of VC from 30 years ago at Sutter Hill Ventures, um, Jeff Skoll, the founding president of eBay, and I'm proud to say that with those four, I was four for four. I've received over $5 million of funding, seed funding, from those four sources. Now, for every one of those, there probably were three or four who rejected me, but that's okay, no worries. I never hear the word no. I always hear the words not yet. If you say no to me, I'm looking at you thinking, yeah, you're saying no now, Charlie, but at some point you're going to change that to a yes. Can you, can you give us some stories of, of the most spectacular no's and failures you had as you went through? The most spectacular failures? I mean, I would say that one of them is in 2003, we did our first survey. We actually had our employees go out to our early libraries in Nepal and Vietnam to talk to the teachers, the parents, and the students to ask, how are we doing? Because it's one thing to set up a library. That's kind of easy, right? Our, our country director from Nepal says, once the library, when you cut the red ribbon on the new library, your job's 5% done. The 95% is a harder part. Are the kids using the library? Are the teachers teaching the kids how to read? Are the kids taking books home with them? And in 2003, we sat down to look at the results of our first survey, and we'd ask the student, the young kids, um, what would cause you to use the library more often? Longer hours, open at night, open on weekends, a friendlier librarian, what would cause you to use the library more often? And the number one answer we got, 52% of kids told us, more books in Nepali, more books in Vietnamese. Most of what we were donating in our libraries were used English books, which were easier to acquire. Uh, and in these countries that we work in, they do teach English as a second language. But when 52% of your customers tell you basically, you're not, doing, you're not giving me the product I'm asking for, 
it's a moment of truth. And this is a huge issue in the developing world because for-profit publishers will not publish books in Zulu or Zosa or Khmer or Lao or Setswana or Tamil or Sinhalese or Nepali or Rajasthani or Chhatrasgari because there's no market, right? Parents can't afford books, so the for-profit publishers don't publish. So you can't find copies of Dr. Seuss or Harry Potter or The Hunger Games in Khmer or in Lao because the parents can't afford it. So but we stared that number in the face and said we have to become a publishing company. It's not enough to just put English language books in the library. That was a moment of truth. And I still remember talking to Dinesh, our country director from Nepal, and saying, you're going to go first. You're going to go find authors and artists to write and illustrate children's books. We want to do original content. We don't want to do a, take a translation of a Western work. We want to tell stories from Nepal, tell stories that are based in the mountains, or take the old folk legends and turn them into, turn them into children's books. Now, <coughs> a lot of people told us this wouldn't work. Right? There's, oh, Nepal, there's no culture of children's literature. It's oral. You always hear, there's always 14 people who want to tell you why things won't work. And we just listen to all the people telling us why it wouldn't work, and so we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. I listened to people tell us that there wasn't the talent base. I said, you got to be kidding me. Go into a market in Nepal. Go into a market in Vietnam. What do you see? You see beautiful handicrafts. You see beautiful artwork. You see hardworking entrepreneurial people. They just need to be asked. So Dinesh, our country, so we did two things. We went to Jeff Skoll, the founding president of eBay, and his executive director, Sally Osberg, and said we need $50,000 to get this thing off the ground. Thank God for Skoll, because they're willing to take risks. Most of the big established foundations, if you're young and you're doing something different, they don't want to talk to you, right? which is really a tragedy. But when you're young, thankfully, a lot of the tech money goes to the stuff that's new and innovative. So we went to Skoll and got money. And then Dinesh went out and found out that there, he did some research, asked around, and found out there was something called the Nepali Society for Children's Literature. And we don't know what the hell they'd been doing all those years, because they hadn't been producing much children's literature, but when he told them that we were going to pay a couple hundred dollars to the author, a couple hundred dollars to the artist, for anybody who had ideas, we had 67 manuscript submissions the first month. It just proved that the talent was out there, and it proved that it was right for us to ignore those who told us why it wouldn't work. And from that came my favorite rule, the Voltaire rule. Voltaire famously said, Nobody ever erected a statue in honor of a critic. And I try to tell all of our new employees that. If somebody tells you it won't work, go do it anyway and make it work. Can you tell us about that first year $35,000 budget? Yeah. Like where it came from? I'm assuming it had a lot of... There were probably more challenges in getting that first year 35000 by any other window, right? Yeah, probably about 10000 of that came from me because I got so frustrated. Like if I had a bad day fundraising, I would just like write a check to Rim to Read for $500 and say, well, I raised $500 today. <laughs> um, sometimes you have to play those psychological games with yourself just to keep your mental energy um, positive. Um, there was a lot less of our first couple years budget than I had anticipated from my old colleagues at Microsoft. Um, one of the things I found most um, depressing in the early years was that so many people who I thought were my friends in the tech world actually only hung out with me because I was the guy who awarded their stock options and determined their bonuses and determined when they got promoted at the end of the year. And that was a tough thing. When you know you used to be able to you had this, you know, relationship with your coworkers and then you're calling them a year later and going, Hey, I'm doing this thing and they're like, That's great. Good luck, click. You know, and I'll never forget running into a guy who used to work for me in the Singapore airport, and he was going on the up escalator, I was going on a down escalator, we see each other, hey, 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 go running up, talk to each other, and I go, what's going on, how's your career going? He proceeded to tell me for five minutes about how great his career was going, this advance, this promotion, this, I'm running this, I'm running that, and he looked at me and he goes, are you still doing that thing with yaks in Nepal? And I go, yeah, and he's like, cool, good to see you, and he walked away. And that was pretty shocking. That was kind of depressing. But what was, I think for the first couple of years, what was electrifying for me was that 95% of the money that came in was from people I had not known prior to starting Room to Read. A lot of cold calling, a lot of networking. I have something I call feet on, I have something I call feet on the street. It's that if you're sitting in your office, you're, if you're on a charity and you're sitting in your office, Nobody's showing up on your door and knocking to go, hey, I'm here. I brought a check to you. You've got to be out there. You've got to be on the airplane. You've got to be making presentations. You've got to be out speaking. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the first couple of years, it was basically kind of like I was traveling like this. I was yeah. running the whole thing from a BlackBerry 
traveling and is trying to get everywhere in the world. And I had a Robin Hood strategy, right? Go everywhere in the world where there's money and say, I'm here to liberate you from your money so that a child in India can get an education or a girl in Cambodia can finish high school. And it's London, Amsterdam, Zurich, New York, Vancouver, Toronto, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore, just perpetual motion, perpetual road trip for me. I've not stopped traveling for 11 years. So how much time did it take before it took off again? Because I'm sure in the beginning. Well, one of the tipping points for us, there's probably been three tipping points for us. Because um, now people say, you know, how are you at 45 million per annum when you were at 35,000? That is insane compound annual growth. I think there's been three tipping points for us. One was in 2002. Uh, Fast Company magazine wrote a four-page profile that was titled John Wood Turns the Page. And it was beautiful. Christine Canterbury, the journalist, spent several days with me in San Francisco. And it was this, this article was all about this really driven guy who was going to change the world and was just getting started. And was just, you're going to hear about this guy, you're going to see him. And it was a beautiful story. And I, remember, I was in Nepal, and I came back after six days out in the middle of nowhere. And I hadn't checked my email in six days. And I went on to my email, and there were like 700 messages. And I thought, oh no, I, I mean, I've got spam. Somebody got my address, and this is all good. I'm going to be clearing out spam for the next couple of hours. And I started looking at the subject lines. And they were, I want to fund a school. I want to start a London chapter. How about a Vancouver chapter? Hey, I'd love to fund the library and enter my mom. And I looked at all these subject lines, and I was like, it's all going to be OK. This is going to be the moment we start to grow. And in that next three months, we realized that our budget was going to, our fundraising was going to go from 165000 the prior year. It went to 735000 We almost quintupled or quadrupled. An engineer and an audience, a math geek, can tell me whether we quadrupled or quintupled. <laughs> next year, we went from 735000 to $1.3 Then we went to $3.7 And it was part, a lot of it was the Fast Company article. If you may read Seth Godin. Seth emailed me a check and said, build me two schools, and then come back to me, and I want to build two more. And then secondly, uh, was the publication of this book, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, uh, published in August of 2006. Uh, when the book came out, we thought it would be a $7 million organization per annum. We ended up finishing that year at $9.3 million, and then we went to $17 million the next year. And a lot of that was 2006, 2007, 2008, bull market, book's doing well, chapters are growing, and the book helped. And then 2007, uh, I appeared on Oprah. Uh, that's what, kind of what brought, part of what brought us together. But Oprah was fantastic because we told her team, we don't just want to be, doing, we don't just want to be on the show, we want Oprah to raise money for us. And they said, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. And we said, ah, come on, come on, please, let, let's do something fun. So we proposed and we worked with them to do this really cool thing called Oprah's Book Drive. And so at the end of the show, Oprah stood up. She was with me. I'm grinning like an idiot, right? I'm standing next to Oprah, like my mom and dad are in the audience. And she's literally holding up one of our local language children's books. And she's saying, we have to support John and his vision of opening thousands of libraries across the developing world. So go to Oprah.com. $1 prints one book. $20 prints 20 books. $50 equals 50 books. And she pointed to her acolytes, her followers, and she said, do it now for the love of reading. Oh my god. The show's going to air in three weeks. Our poor IT guy, Dustin, is like, we have a shared server, and Oprah brought down Livestrong last month. So we upgraded to eight dedicated servers, and we got ready, and we literally had our head of HR, who's from North Carolina originally, at 1 PM on the West Coast. She's got her parents' television on speakerphone. So we're listening into the East Coast airing of Oprah, and we hear, do it now for the love of reading. And then about a minute later, we hear our three guys in the IT office going, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. They brought down all eight servers, raised over three and a half million dollars as a result of that book drive. So that was another magic okay. inflection point okay. for us. Yeah, how, how about, um, I'm curious, in the somewhere between 2000 when you met your, your former Microsoft colleague, right, right passing at the airport, uh, completely ignoring you all the way till that, that Fast Company article. There must have been, am I correct in assuming the darkest times you had were probably in that window? I think there were two really dark times. One was in that window, and part of it was, you know, like when you know when you're a child and you, like, you want to 
you want to say something but your mouth can't form the words or you want to walk but you can't and you just get to that you get frustrated and there, there was I was like that because I had all these communities that wanted schools and wanted libraries wanted scholarships for the girls and we were saying no 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 is the ugliest word in the English language right I wanted to say not yet or I wanted to say yes and so the early years were tough because I didn't want to build one school or I didn't want to open 10 libraries I wanted to open a thousand schools I wanted wanted to open more libraries in mm -hmm. Carnegie. So that was a tough time. Thanks to Fast Company and to the growth of the chapter network, that started to change. I'd say the other dark time for me was Q4 of 08. If people remember where they were when Lehman melted down and where Bear Stearns went under and where B of A did the, the kind of the midnight rescue of Merrill Lynch and the whole world was just crashing down in Q4 of 08. I lost, five, not I, we lost five million dollars of written commitments people who had made commitments to Room to Read, and we had grown our staff, we had grown our project base, we had grown the number of commitments we made to local communities as a result of their written commitments, and all of a sudden, poof, $5 million vaporizes. And in my next book, which is being published in January, I have a whole chapter about that, about sitting in a, I was, I was, that night I was too depressed to run, I'm a running addict, and I've never in my life been too depressed to run, but that week I was too depressed to run, and I went to a coffee shop and I sat there thinking, who are we going to fire? What projects are we going to cancel? What kids are we going to have to tell your scholarship is over? And I sat in a coffee shop and then I was writing in my journal and I got to the point and I, I got to the point of just being like, oh, you know, this is ridiculous. I just got to put the journal away and I'll read the newspaper for a while and I'm going to reboot my brain, right? Because I, I think you got at certain times, I mean, as an ex-Microsoft guy, I should never use the word reboot more than once in a presentation, but I had to reboot. <laughs> my brain and so I kind of decided I'm going to read the New York Times for half an hour and I'll go back go back to work got to find that five million dollars somewhere I don't know where and I was reading the Times and there was a story about girls in Pakistan who had been attacked with acid men on motorbikes had come by and thrown acid on these two little girls because they dared to go to school and I read that article and I said to myself, what century are we living in that girls who dare to go to school can have acid thrown on them? And what kind of coward am I if I think we're going to cancel projects, if I think we're going to tell girls they can't come into our girls' education program? And so I vowed right there, no layoffs, no canceled projects. I don't know how we'll do it, but we're going to find that $5 million. And I tried to get my team to rally. The fundraising team was heroic, the management team was heroic, the volunteer fundraising chapters around the world were heroic. We made a vow not to cancel a single project, and our revenue grew 23% from 08 to 09. Our revenue grew 20% from 09 to 010. Our revenue grew 26% last year. So we've actually doubled in size during the global financial crisis because we refused to accept the fact that even a global financial crisis was going to derail us from our mission of reaching as many kids as possible. That's great. Can you tell the group about, you know, the discussion we had with Mike from Atlassian and kind of what you guys did? I thought that was just, just such a cool thing that you guys did with the whole Australian company. Oh, yeah, yeah. How many of you guys know about Atlassian? Anybody? Software company? Uh-oh. Okay. Atlassian.com. It's like Atlas, but it's Atlassian. A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com company based out of Sydney, founded by two co-founders, Mike and Scott, who literally dropped out of college, whacked some money on their credit cards, and said, let's start a software company. And they have an office now in San Francisco, an office in Amsterdam. Uh, they're backed by Axel Partners. Axel put $60 million in in the last round. It was the largest round Axel ever did. They make software testing, coding, debugging tools, stuff that's not very glamorous, but that works very, very well. And what, they, what Atlassian did was two and a half years ago, Scott and Mike approached me, they'd seen me speak at a wine gala in Sydney and said, we want to do something different. We want to put our product out there and ask people to download it, download trial versions. We don't want to give it away for free because we think that free is not going to be valued. So what we want to do instead is charge $5 and have all $5 go to Room to Read. So people have to have skin in the game. They have to put a credit card down to download our product. We'll give the money to you. Five products, $5, five days, five day offer. I said, okay. What do you think you're going to raise? They said, probably $25,000. Our goal is to have 5,000 downloads. Great. Let's do it. Let's try it. Why not? Sounds fun. They raised $25,000 the first day. 
the word went around, it went around the tweet sphere and Facebook, and everybody's talking about it. Oh my gosh, do this, you get great products, room to get some money. They didn't stop, their developers, their product support said don't stop, even if we have to take more phone calls, let's just keep this thing going. They raised $125,000 in five days. It's a lot of money, that's enough money to support the printing of 125,000 local language books. That's enough money to support um, 500 girls in our scholarship program, so it's, it's great. Well, then they came back and said, we're going to double down. Ten products, ten dollars, all the money goes to Room to Read. Great. Within a year, they presented us with a large oversized check for one million dollars. They're now at 1.8 million dollars raised. Last year, Barclays Capital was supposed to be our largest corporate funder with a $750,000 gift. They got pitched or peaked at the post by Atlassian, which came in with an $850,000 check at the end of the year. They raised nearly $2 million for us, and they've done it $10 at a time. Well, every good idea deserves to get replicated, so I was talking to a guy in Sydney who works for a legal discovery software company called Nuix, N-U-I-X. I told him this story. Nuix decided they would go second. So they've now launched a $100 product. All 100 bucks goes to Room to Read. And they're not about $45,000 with a goal of raising a quarter million dollars for us. So there's something in this whole idea of getting a great piece of code, making it a co piece of code that has a social cause, putting it up there saying the money goes to Rim to Read. And we're hoping that 10 or 20 different companies are going to replicate this model and help to fund us. Because if they can kick off that much money, we can get a lot done. Any questions from the, from the group here? The room next door? I know, I know Boston as well as um, San Francisco and London. Anybody? Questions? Maybe I'll start with Boston. Any questions? Can you guys from John? Hi, I'm Rachel uh, in the Boston office, and um, I had a question about your background at Microsoft and just um, in building um, Room to Read. Do you find any, did you find any difference in um, the company culture that you were building um, that you wanted to take away from Microsoft, but also? Um, bring new spin to, to your new startup and, then, and now to your 600 person company? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I would say there's a couple things from Microsoft I wanted to emulate and then there's a couple things that I, did not, I wanted to not emulate. Um, the stuff I wanted to emulate is really the talent of finding and hiring the most talented people. And there's a, I think sometimes people think that in the charity world, it's okay to hire non-talented people because it's charity, it's not as important as the for-profit sector. And I think the exact opposite, I think what charities do or what Angel Wish does or what Room to Read does or what Teach for America does or what Donors Choose does is every bit as important as the for-profit world. So we have to have our eye out for talent. So number one is, you know, Microsoft was always very good at recruiting talent. Number two is a culture of performance, of setting bold goals and not accepting anything other than peak performance. And we as a charity are quite good at getting rid of employees who don't perform. Uh, it's not because we're mean people, but it's because we believe in our mission. And if people are not performing, uh, we would prefer they go work somewhere else. And so we uh, probably emulate a lot of the tech sector in that, that we, we have very demanding goals. And if employees don't reach them, um, they're allowed to leave and go somewhere else. Um, I would say third is really um, the idea that bold goals attract bold people. You know, when, when Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates said, a computer on every desk and in every home, is our goal. They were told they were crazy. Right at that time, a computer on every desk, a computer in every home, that seemed like a crazy thing to say in 1996. Sorry, 1986. And now, of course, as we all know, we have, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven different devices that are as powerful as a computer was back then. So when I started Room to Read, I said that my goal is to reach 10 million children by the year 2020. And if anybody's scared of that, that's okay, but we're going to go big with this. You know, go big or go home was the attitude that I had towards it. And I'm proud to say that we're actually going to reach our 10 millionth child five years early. We'll reach our 10 millionth student by the year 2015. So I'd say those are the three things from Microsoft I tried to emulate. Um, some of the stuff I tried to, I've tried to avoid really is kind of being too much of a hard ass. You know, I, I loved working for Steve Ballmer. I learned a lot from him. Uh, but sometimes there's something about that culture that could just get a little bit, you felt like you weren't appreciated, too much was never enough, you didn't really get a lot of pats on the back. And I think it's fair to say that when I was managing groups at Microsoft, I never signed a mail, you know, big hug, John. I do now, because it's a little bit softer when you're in this sector. And 90% of the people who work for Room to Read are not on our payroll. 
I mentioned those 10,000 volunteers in 57 cities who are busy people who give their time to run read for fundraising. The reason they do it is because they really feel appreciated. They feel like they're making a difference. They know that the schools are getting built because of their service. But I spent a lot of time writing thank you notes. I spent a lot of time making thank you phone calls. I spent a lot of time writing thank you emails. I probably spend 30% of my day thanking people. Literally 30%, and I work 60 hours a week. Is that the only one for Microsoft, or is it? Yeah. That's probably the, yeah, probably, the biggest. probably complete. Okay. Um, any questions from London? Hey, this is a great night from London. Um, I just wanted to ask, are there any business people have influenced or inspired you since you started with to be, before you started to be? Sorry, that cut out a little bit. Are there any, did any, any, any business people that have inspired you? Oh, business people who have inspired me. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's, there, there's, there's quite, a, quite a few. I mean, I'm not sure that any of them are necessarily, a lot of them are probably names you wouldn't know. So it's people who, a lot of them who, who sit, on our, sit on our board. Um, in London, John Ridding, who's the CEO of the Financial Times, which is a big supporter of ours, has been a really good friend and a really good mentor. Um, Jerry Del Messier, who's the co-CEO of Barclays Capital, is on our board, has been a really uh, good mentor and been a very good friend to Room to Read. Um, in the tech sector, you know, Mark Andreessen was a very early believer in Room to Read and invested pretty heavily when we were very, very young. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, quite, quite, quite a few business leaders, and I, I read business literature pretty religiously because I think that there's something in the capitalist model that really works well and inspires. And I, what I've tried to do is take that same um, belief that when you, you know when the private sector sees opportunity, when it sees an unmet need, the reaction is to immediately scale. Right, you're going to grow your business. If Next Jump sees a po an opportunity, if Atlassian sees an opportunity, they're going to they're going to they're going to move really quickly to capitalize on it. And in the private in the uh, social sector, quite often you don't have that same mentality. And I've tried to really take that. Right, I've looked at Starbucks and said, how do they open outlets so quickly? And I'm proud to say that we actually open libraries at a faster rate than Starbucks opens outlets. In their eighth year post-IPO, they opened 1,000 coffee shops. In our eighth year as an organization, we opened 1,600 libraries and over 100 schools. So they had 1,000 new locations, we had 1,700 locations. And so we try to really honor the, the, the private sector by emulating it. McDonald's opens one new outlet a day in China. Whether or not that's a good thing for China or not, we can debate. Uh, Room to Read opens a new school somewhere in Asia every 30 hours. So McDonald's new outlet every 24 hours, Room to Read new school every 30 hours. I'd like to get that up to a higher number. And one day say, McDonald's, we're, we've caught you. Then we're 23 hours, 22 hours, 21 hours, 20 hours. And in the same way we've out Starbucks, Starbucks, and out Carnegie, Carnegie, I really want to out McDonald's, McDonald's, and start opening schools at a faster rate. Great. Any question from San Francisco? Anybody else on the phone? Uh, this is Toby in London. Okay. From, from my understanding, the biggest challenge is for nonprofit organizations is an inconsistent income. What is it that you've done to? Try and manage this yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So one of the challenges when you're a nonprofit is you don't have as predictable of an income stream as you do if you're a for-profit venture, right? Starbucks knows when they open the doors in the morning, they're going to have a certain number of people coming in, and the average transaction size is going to be four dollars and eighty cents, and they can guess and they can predict how many customers and how many locations making how much money. In the in the charity sector, you don't have that to the same extent. So we try to do a number of things to make our cash flows more predictable. Number one is asking investors for multi-year grants. Once somebody becomes an investor in Room to Read and they go through one or two years, we say, hey, how about making a three-year commitment or a five-year commitment so we can actually have more predictable cash flows. Number two is our fundraising chapter. So in London, for example, uh, we have a really active fundraising chapter that every year does a big wine gala with Jancis Robinson, who's the wine writer for the Financial Times. We get Barry Brothers Rudd, one of the biggest wine companies in London, to get behind it. And we, they commit to us every year. They're going to raise a million pounds on one night. Our Hong Kong chapter every year is going to produce $2 million for their annual gala. Our Tokyo chapter just last week had their first million dollar night. So we try to have these events all around the world where even if it's variable, maybe they raise 
half a million versus a million in a night, that's okay because we can then aggregate that up and predict with some degree of, of, uh, uh, of hopeful accuracy how much money is going to come in. So I would say in a given year, I would say probably I can predict about 60% of our cash flow. And then the rest of it is just basically being out, feet on the street, butt on the airplane, get out, travel around the world, and just make the ask as many times a day as possible. Any questions from here? Mm -hmm. Can you speak up just a little bit? Because I've got the fan going here. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. So just to repeat it for those who might not have heard it, the question was really about teachers and librarians, and it's one thing to build a library, but you have to have the adults who are there. And that's, that's actually a very prescient uh, observation because when, we started, when I started Room to Read, I kind of just naively assumed that if you opened the library, kids would come in and start reading. And if they couldn't read, they would read to each other. And we really underinvested in the teachers and underinvested in the librarians. And it was a mistake. Um, that we made, and it's a mistake that we moved pretty rapidly to try to um, to try to fix. Um, I'm proud to say, in the last two years, over 20,000 teachers, and I'll repeat that number: over 20,000 teachers have gone through training provided by Room to Read in some critical areas, including literacy. How do you teach a child to learn letters in Khmer? How do you teach a child to de to, de to decode? How do you teach a child to actually form sentences? We do what's called habit of reading which is how do you teach kids that reading is fun. Reading's not a punishment, reading is fun. Reading's something that's great to do. And then librarian training, how do you set up a library? How do you make sure the library is well organized so that kids know that if they're reading at a first grade level, here's where I find these books. Or if I want books about animals or I want picture books, how do I find those? Getting library um, checkout systems in place so that the books actually go home with the kids has been a huge area of investment for us. And I'm proud to say that now 97% of our libraries have checkout systems in place. Last year, over 9 million books were checked out and have gone home with the kids, which is great because then the kids are quite often teaching their younger siblings to read or sometimes even teaching their mothers to read. I've had illiterate mothers in India who are learning to read because their daughters are bringing books home from a room to read library. So that teacher investment and the librarian investment has been a huge part of what we do. And I should say that when Room to Read funds a school or a library, we don't just go in and build it for the community and say, step aside, we're going to build this for you. It's really a three-part agreement. The government, the Ministry of Education agrees with us to provide teachers and librarians and pay their ongoing salaries. The community donates land and donates sweat equity. So if we're building a school, the parents will come out and dig the foundation. They'll carry the building supplies from the roadside up, the, up to the mountain, um, mountain village. They'll mix the cement. They'll pound nails. They'll build the bookshelves. So everything we do, those 1,600 schools, those 13,000 libraries, or a three-part agreement. Room to Read brings our money in along with our expertise, but the government's there side by side, the community's there side by side. And that's going to make definitely a sure sustainability of the program because the local people have skin in the game. They've sacrificed to get that school built. They've sacrificed to get that library open. And one of the things I think is really important to do right in philanthropy is to make sure that those who are going to be the recipients of what you're giving actually value it enough that they're going to have skin in the game. And quite often we get that wrong, right? You can look at the, you know, the EU, United States. They go off into the developing world and they dump hundreds of tons of surplus grain. And then they price out the local farmers. People do use t-shirt drives or shoe drives or whatever and go into a rural village in Uganda and dump 20,000 used t-shirts out of the market. What does that do? Well, if you're a Ugandan entrepreneur who wants to produce and sell clothing, Suddenly you can't because the market's been flooded with these used t-shirts or used shoes. And so I think these models have to really be thought through to not treat people in the developing world as passive aid recipients who are lazy or dumb. Because they're not. They're not lazy at all. They're not any less intelligent than any of us, the rest of us. We're all born with the same gray matter. So Room to Read really tries to honor those local communities by requiring that they have skin in the game and co-fund each project. Any other questions?
Yeah, actually, um, they, they are. My, um, my parents uh, were at the opening of the 10,000th library in Nepal. My dad, at age 84, decided nothing was going to stop him from going to Nepal and being present at the opening of the 10,000th library. I'll never forget when I invited my parents to come along, my dad said, even if I have to cash in my retirement savings to buy a business class ticket, I'm going to do it so I can be there and I can arrive and be awake and ready to go. And so um, my parents are actually going to Zambia with me this summer. Um, my parents have never stepped foot on the African continent. And my dad at age 86, my mom at age 81, they're so psyched to go to Zambia and meet, uh, meet the kids and be able to see the work. So. You know, hopefully they will remain healthy and uh, be ready for an African adventure this July. Any other questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I've seen some of these uh, initiatives for like uh, laptops and stuff for other countries too. Uh, with these libraries, does the technology play any part or is um, just physical books still the best way to reach out? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, technology does not play a part yet. It may someday. Um, but most of the places that we're working are off the grid for data. Often there's, there's a lack of electricity. And in many cases, the cost to deliver technology is five to ten times larger than the cost to deliver something simple and, and low tech like books and like libraries and things like that. So uh, if you look, for example, at the way we work, $5,000 is literally enough to open a library somewhere in Asia that serves 400 children. So it's literally $12 per child served. And sometimes people ask us, how have you opened so many libraries? Well, we keep the cost as low as possible by having a very low-tech, low-cost approach. Uh, our girls' education program is an example of this. This is going to shock anybody here. But it costs us $250 per girl per year to get a girl into this program and keep her into the program. And think about that for a second. A life has changed forever by the $12 that brings an, an incremental child access to a library, by the $250 that tells a girl in India or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, we believe in you. And one of the reasons I'm an optimist is that if that's how low the price of change is, we can build a school for $35,000. So we now have, we have grade school students who have built sister schools. We have university campus chapters who have built sister schools. The price of change is so low that that's what makes me an optimist. To say we've already reached six million children, we'll reach 10 million children by 2015. I want to reach 50 million kids in my lifetime. Right? I have a friend who's a Buddhist um, scholar, and I once asked him, what's the secret in your mind? What's the secret to life? And he said, oh, that's easy. He said, figure out what you want to say in your deathbed and work backwards from there. And I'll leave you with that piece of advice. Figure out what you want to say in your deathbed and work backwards from there, because if you can do that and you can nail that, you're set for life. Perfect. Well, John, I appreciate you coming in. And if you guys want copies of books from John or even Zach the Yak books, please, please come up. Otherwise, um, can I make yeah, can I please, make my, my can I make the closing course. pitch? Yes. So, just for those of you who are remote, um, we do have a Boston chapter. San Francisco chapter, London chapter. If you're interested in getting involved, you can go to roomtoread.org and you'll find information on that. Or if you just want to email me, I can connect you up. I'm john at roomtoread.org. I'm wood at roomtoread.org. And I'm john.wood at roomtoread.org. <laughs> when you run a charity, you can't be elusive and hard to find. But we'd love to get people involved. I know you have code for, the, code for a cause. And we've got a lot of stuff we want to work on, including a, a, an upgrade or an update of the uh, Yak Pack website for our Zach the Yak uh, books. We need help with that. And here in New York, we do have our New York chapter has our annual spring gala on, Mar on May 17th. And we'd love to get you guys involved and have some of you come out for it. I can promise you our, our, our events are really fun. There's not a lot of blah, 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 blah. It's just people mixing, mingling, having a drink, coming out, and supporting the cause. And it's a really fun group of people involved with Room to Read. So if people are free on May 17th, uh, there's information up on the website, and we even have a bulk uh, purchase deal. So if you want to come as a group, you can actually get a, a, a group discount. That's great. And, and also, just to, so, so Rachel in Boston asked the first question, is spearheading our Code for a Cause initiative? And um, just to give, give you guys some context, Zach Hi, Rachel. the Yak. Um, <laughs> you Rachel, so, you look awesome today. <laughs> um, so, so the Zach the Yak book is, is something that, it's kind of cool where, where what John and the team has done is gotten businesses to sponsor the book. Um, so the printing of the book is fully sponsored, and it's a $10 book. That so the literally, Republic of Tea, if we can zoom in. Yeah. 
So, so it's a ten dollar book that one hundred percent goes to goes to help them, um, you know, put put you know libraries, kids to schools. So, yeah. So it's a very it's a it's a very cool model. So basically, the Republic of Tea underwrites the production costs of the book. Scholastic manages all the print production. So we actually get Scholastic pricing on our printing, even though we're a, a little minnow and they're the big whale. They 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 lean on their suppliers to give us uh, the uh, volume discount. So our cost to produce a book is less than a dollar. Republic of Tea pays for the production costs, so our cost of goods sold is zero, and we sell these for ten dollars each. And so we're going to have Zach's going to be kind of a latter day Tin Tin, where the first adventure, Zach the Yak with books in his back, takes place in Nepal, and then Zach the Yak and his new friend Quack um, go off to help build a school in Vietnam. And then the next book is going to be Zach the Yak, uh, or sorry, Zach and Quack in the Australian outback. So they're going to travel all around the world. So we're hoping to sell 100,000 books this year to raise a million dollars for Room to Read. And that's to the chap in London who asked about predictability of cash flows. The Yak Pack business is one of the ways we're going to make our cash flows more predictable. That's great. And I think what, what they need is help um, upgrading the e-commerce site and sort of building out the whole whole e-commerce capability of Zach the Yak. Sale. Exactly. So Rachel, I'm uh, John at RoomToRead.org just in case you want to <laughs> chat. Excellent. Well, John, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, sir. Great to see you. I also, can I just say one, one more sure. thing? Charlie didn't ask me to say this at all, but I just want to say this is a great company. I see a lot of companies. I do a lot of company presentations, but I have never seen a company, and this is not just your leader. It's all of you who are leaders and keepers of the culture, but I have never seen a company where I've been more impressed with the level of attention to detail it's paid to everything from the snacks, to the food, to the gym, to the personal trainers, to the fact that you have toothpaste and, and mouthwash in the bathroom, uh, to the fact that you have very, very healthy snacks. So I think whatever you guys have going here is really special and don't neglect it because there's a lot of really badly run companies out there and there's a lot of places I go where I speak to companies and you know, you, you guys probably have friends, you, you can walk into their company, you just don't, you don't feel it. Whatever you guys have here is really special, and I know that you're going to keep growing, and as you grow, all the new people who come on board are going to be looking to you for guidance. So whatever you have here is really special. So I just want to tell you, please keep it alive, because I've seen companies that have grown and they've lost their soul, and what you guys have here is really, really special. So keep, keep it going, and please keep growing, and I definitely hope that over time, Next Jump and Room to Read can really partner together and get more done. So anyway, thank you again for having me. Thank you.